Hi everyone, welcome to the Wire Wheel webinar on privacy technology implementation, lessons learned. We're just gonna give it a couple of minutes for our, for our people to enter the room and then we'll get started. Hi everyone, welcome to um, the Wire Wheel webinar on privacy technology implementation lessons learned. My name is Judy Gordon. I'm the VP of product marketing here at Wire Wheel. And uh, I'm your host for today. I'm gonna kick it over to our moderator, Stephen Bucco. Stephen, take it, out, take it from here. All right, thanks, Judy. Um, really, really excited that everyone is here today. My name is Stephen Bucco. I'm the director of professional services here at Wire Wheel. Um, and I've got a, a few special guests with me today, and um, I'll have them introduce themselves here in a, in a quick second. But before we get into that, I kind of want to set the tone of what we're looking for and what we're trying to get out of today's session. Um, so this is a, a session around data privacy, implementing solutions, and you know, build versus buy, and how I should um, evaluate the market, and what are some of the things that uh, Monica and Doug here that we'll talk about here in a second, what are some of the things they've seen in the market? So. Um, I want this to be somewhat interactive, so feel free to drop questions into the question box. I'll, I'll grab them and stop the group here. So I, I want this to be interactive, kind of freewheeling. I do have a few questions I'm going to ask them as, as your moderator for today. Uh, but to kick things off, I'm going to turn it over to them to introduce themselves. Um, first, we have Monica Gaffney, the Director of Compliance from StockX. Uh, Monica, why don't you tell us about yourself? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yes, I'm Monica Gaffney. I've been with StockX for just over a year now. For those of you that don't, don't, don't know, StockX is basically a marketplace. It was the first stock market of things, um, a very unique platform that we have built that really kind of mimics the stock market concept when it comes to purchasing goods. And um, just a, a lot of awesome growth the company's experienced over the last few years, significant growth from a global perspective. So I think as we go through this seminar, we're going to, you know, touch on a lot of things that we've had to deal with, um, not only in the U.S., but globally as well. All right. Well, thanks, Monica. And then we have another guest today, Doug Rents. He's a CCPA consultant. Uh, he's worked at various different uh, firms, including several insurance uh, groups. Uh, Doug, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, thanks, Stephen. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, I actually... Um, <laughs> Probably a better title would be senior project manager. I just retired from Affleck at the end of last year. Um, and um, after almost 15 years with the company, um, I think everyone's probably familiar with Affleck. It's uh, the leading supplier of supplemental insurance products. And um, I have uh, started back with Affleck just this week um, on a, a contract basis. All right. Well, we're really excited to have both of Monica and Doug here on, on our panel to answer questions, hopefully your questions as well. I have, I have some tough ones and some softball, so we'll start with a softball. Um, and we'll start with Monica and then we'll, we'll jump over to Doug and I'd love to kind of maybe some back and forth. Um, kind of framing the question and, and starting, everybody views data privacy a little bit different. Everybody looks at uh, privacy through a different lens, either, either through your general counsel or through your technology team, or even your technology stack. So I, I'm really quite, I'm, I'm really curious to understand why, whenever you were evaluating kind of solutions, what what problems were you trying to address, Monica, in picking a solution? Like what what was useful to you when picking a data privacy uh, solution or software? Um, and there's a lot of products in the market, so I'm just curious. Um, sure, uh, you know, honestly, uh, the StockX fundamental thought process is. It has always been sort of, can we build it versus buying it? Um, I think uh, because the company was fairly new, a lot of the work that we did was all like Google Sheets based and that kind of thing. Um, what ended up happening as we were evaluating what was going on was, um, I don't think we truly had a full appreciation for the scope of work that would come with the implementation of these privacy laws, whether it was GDPR or CCPA or whomever, and the amount of requests and the number of customers that would actually le leverage the legislations to either 
whether it's give me the data you hold on me or you know forget you knew me kind of thing. So there was just a lot of analysis. Once we sort of stood up the program thinking, oh, okay, we can do this. And then reality hit and really recognized very quickly that the, just the quantity of work and we're talking, you know, we get thousands in a three week cycle was just more than we could manage. So there was a lot of back and forth on, do we try to build something? Do we buy something? And we eventually went down the path of, let's not try to build, this isn't our bailiwick. Let's just see what we've got out there. And we did go with a, um, with obviously with the white real solution, but we did end up getting a third party solution to help us just manage the requests coming in because it was just, it was just too much to manage the way we were doing it. I think a lot of people can relate to that market. That's a, uh, that's a very common um, thing that I hear in the market. So Doug, typically, what are you, what are you hearing uh, whenever you're looking at solutions and um, I guess from maybe from the app like perspective or, or maybe other companies you work with with data privacy, typically, you know, what, what are you looking for? Um, and as someone that has worked, I think, in a wide variety of components with data privacy, what, what's interesting to you when you look for a solution? Um, well, I can, you want me to tell you about our particular situation too, or just, uh, I, I think, it, I think it's however you want to answer it. Okay. Um, I think okay. I well, I'll want your opinion. Okay. Well, I'll start with that. I guess, uh, we didn't really have, uh, I think the time to consider building an application. We started, um, I got involved, um, and we kicked off the project in October of 2019. So we only had a few months to, um, put in our, our processes to comply with the CCPA regulation. Um, and we, we did look at a, another uh, tool, had a trial with them and, and determined that they weren't quite mature enough or ready to handle you know, what we thought our use cases were gonna be. And, and at the time we weren't really sure you know, what the volume of requests might be. Um, so we knew we needed to get something in that, that we could handle uh, be able to intake requests and um, you know administer them and and respond to to the requesters. I think that's the main thing we were looking at, um, and we had to do it pretty quickly. We only had a couple of months, so I think for us that was kind of our situation, and um, probably that's you know I think um, yeah Monica touched on it too. It's just whatever your requirements are, and then and then looking for a platform that that has that um, sort of end to end. Um, capability and able to integrate in with with your your um, reporting databases or uh, other business systems as needed. All right. Uh, so right. I'll cover Doug uh, maybe for the next question uh, for you. So, okay. whenever you pick this solution uh, or you know you are evaluating other solutions, talk about your implementation, and I'll go to Monica next. Kind of what went well. What kind of challenges did you face? I mean, um, I have to imagine changing regulations, right, is is one that everyone's going to address. But specifically from a project manager or something, what problems did you did did you face? I'm sure others on the line will kind of hear the similar problems. Um, well, from a technology standpoint, I don't know that we had too many problems because we started pretty simply, um, and that's you know, kind of what I'd recommend, I guess, is to start simple and then, and just try to have, um, um, in our case, um, have a tool that we felt like we could grow with and expand, you know, to accommodate um, any, any level of volume of requests and new regulations and so forth. And so again, we were, we were under a lot of pressure just to get something in quickly, getting kind of a minim minimally viable product, I think is the term we used back then, is to um, you know be able to comply with the regulation and demonstrate that you're complying with the regulation, and it, and it included more than just putting in a platform you know to um, intake and and you know administer the requests. It included the work included looking at uh, enhancements to your privacy policies, online privacy notifications, and so forth. Um, and then considering, and then we did a lot of work with uh, on the intake process. You know, setting up the call center, getting there prepared to to take take requests, and then also looking at our priority systems in terms of um, doing an inventory of personal PII, and you know, creating a data map showing the lineage and flow of 
personal information throughout the company. So we had all all of that work going on in addition to just trying to get a platform in place to um, handle requests. All right, uh, same question, right, same question. Monica. Um, we'll talk about your implementation at Stock. Okay. Kind of what went well, you know, what challenges challenges did you face? I mean, I'm sure it's kind of different phases uh, throughout your life cycle and exactly. uh, kind of, you know, being compliant. Okay, exactly. So a little different experience than Doug, Doug um, talked about by the, you know, we had already put in place a number of things from a GDPR perspective. So C CCPI wasn't a heavy lift for us. As I said uh, previously, we started out with a very manual process. Um, so as we launched the implementation into Wirewheel, um, again, initial experience was really positive. We really didn't see a lot of um, challenges. The setup was fairly easy. I think the biggest challenge for us was getting our website set up, even with the tools provided um, and working with our marketing team to get that piece in place. Uh, we, we did a phased in approach, which I think helped us a lot. So we slowly migrated requests into Wirewheel and we did a phased redirection of people into Wirewheel to do their requests versus um, just basically opening the floodgates, which helped us uh, learn a lot of things, tweak our workflows. We missed some things along the way that we needed to do to help us um, keep track of like what batch a request was processed in or just different flows that we needed. Um, and, uh, you know, we do have integrations that flow out to other teams in the company to do reviews um, before we actually will process like a delete request. We have other teams that we want to review everything. So um, it was pretty, out of the gate was pretty good. Again, the same challenge that we came up to probably more quicker again than we maybe anticipated, uh, all came back to volume again. Um, so what we've been doing is working very closely with Steven and his, his team to actually go, we, we accelerated the next phase, which was starting to build in automation. We accelerated that more quickly than we were originally planning um, so that we could build uh, the integration points with some of our base systems. So, cause we were literally no lie I think we were touching, what did we map out? We were touching each request like three or four times across oh the God. company, which was crazy. Um, so we've accelerated uh, the automation of that. And we actually, fingers crossed, within the next couple of weeks, we'll get to the point where we are fairly touchless from a customer service management perspective as far as managing the requests. Um, and then the follow on automation phase is going to be the actually automate the um, actions that go along with the requests, whether it's do, actually doing the delete and, and automating those delete calls or automating the access calls, et cetera. And on top of that, we did redesign our web page. Um, we totally were caught unawares um, on the way the web page was and our request for access, like increased like 20 fold. It was, it was crazy. So we've been doing some work to kind of uh, with, again, with Steven and his team to address that piece of it as well. Monica, I'm getting a few questions on our Q and A. Uh, one of them here is from Jane. Um, so, so anyone that uh, wants to ask questions, I'm looking right at them. So, so send them my way. Um, I'm getting a few questions around um, specifically your, your, the solution that you're using this CCPA solution for. Um, as everyone knows, you can use um, a CCPA is incredibly all over the place, right? You, you know, there's 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 uh, data subject access request solutions. Mm -hmm. There's various different assessment related solutions, data discovery solutions, and so I'm. I, I think the question from Jane in, in the chat is, um, what solution are you using? Uh, I guess your your, your product for um, it. I believe it's DSAR, if I know you well. So we are. Yeah, we are right now. We are doing the DSAR. Um, requests only at this stage of the game. Like I said, um, we underestimated some things as we were going through it. Now, funny that you asked that question because I actually have an action item, Stephen, um, to reach out. And, uh, but we also did purchase the, the discovery module and the goal is to also leverage that. And um, I was actually just in a meeting yesterday and we are going to kick that phase of it off very shortly here. 
starting with getting a demo of the current product and working to build that in. But we, the plan is always to implement both of them. We just underestimated phase one of the DSAR side of the fence, um, but we are jumping very quickly over to the data side um, within the next couple of months. Great, and uh, same question to you, Doug, um, just to make sure that everyone in the audience understands kind of the, 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 the challenges. Um, are you doing assessments or DSAR requests or opt out or cookie management requests? Again, it's such a wide, wide industry. Yeah, we're, we're doing DSAR requests only at this point. All right, great. And I think it sounds like um, uh, Monica and her company have a lot higher volume than we do. I think we've been fortunate. We don't, we don't get a lot of requests. So that's actually been uh, a nice, a nice uh, discovery <laughs> or was early last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, another question that I have is, and we'll start with Doug, uh, is there anything that you wish that you would have done differently in uh, tackling a CCPA solution? Uh, it could be everything from managing timelines, stakeholder timelines and expectations, all the way yeah. to understanding what complete compliance looks like. So um, what would have you done differently? Well, I think in one one thing in our situation would have been nice to have started a few months earlier. Um, I, I wasn't in. We had a consulting firm in uh, in the summer of 2019 that did a CCPA readiness assessment, and then for whatever reason there was a several month delay before the implementation kicked off, and that's when I joined the project in mid October. So we didn't have a lot of time um, to cover everything. We had to cover more than just implementing the platform, which um, with Wirewheel was pretty, uh, actually was uh, pretty uh, straightforward. I think probably sent, spent more work trying to get through the contract than, um, than actually configuring the tool. Um, so um, that was all pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, so probably some more lead time would have been nice. Um, I can't think, you know, in our situation, you know, again, we took the approach of kind of starting small, just handling the request, being able to collect the re request and, and respond to them. So it was, you know, our implementation with you all was more kind of out of the box for the most part. And then, and, and then as you know, Stephen, we worked on some enhancements last year to, um, to do some customizations. And, and Monica, here for you. Um, what else, what, what maybe would have you done differently? And, and, and this is actually, I kind of want to do a kind of a two part question actually here because StockX is international and has um, contributed to GDPR in the past. Do you feel that that gave you a little bit of an edge, right? Whenever you're, or did you feel like you were more efficient in the U.S. implementing CCPA? Um, kind of a lessons learned thing. I, I, I'm sure, you know, the reason I ask is I got a question on the chat about that. <laughs> We were actually the other way around. Um, we had worked uh, with outside counsel and the teams uh, internally to set up our process from a GDPR perspective so that when CCPA come to the came to the table, we were already well down that path. And as we evaluated the, you know, the uh, subject as at access or not subject access, but basically the uh, rights within um, CCPA, you know, as many of you know, right, they're very similar to GDPR. Um, so we were, we had a fairly good path um, in place. And basically, we were able to pretty much leverage that and lift that for for CCPA. So it really wasn't a huge lift for that. Now, if I take the other half of your question, which is, um, what would I maybe have done differently, I definitely would have done automation right from the get go. Um, just again, we should have known better knowing uh, the volume of, of data that we had, which is where I shared, right? Where typically we can be 800 to 1200 in a three week cycle request, right? Um, we, should have, we should have just right out of the gate gone for automation and linked it into our, our system um, versus trying to basically use, uh, you know, customer service, uh, agents to manage the queue, um, that in of itself has presented some challenges, right? Because, um, you know, I, I don't mean this in a negative way, but we use, you know, entry level, lower end, entry level resources. So they're following a script and it's, you know, it just created a, 
it just, it's not always as clean as you think it should be. Um, so the automation that we're working on now, I literally should have done that last July, August, not now. I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that as uh, their number of requests continue to climb. Uh, it, it seems nice and peachy to get started and then it starts to, it starts to give, keep you busy, more, more busy than you were expecting. Um, so another question we have in our chat. So I'm not sure if the two of you have followed Apple's built-in privacy uh, browser uh, with the latest release with Big Sur. Um, are you expecting more privacy requests because of this? Is this something that you think is going to impact your business? Uh, maybe we can start with Monica first. So this happened just the other day, but they, they had a release that um, included privacy controls in the Safari browser. Um, they, yes, and I've had a few conversations with our product team on the fact that that's coming out and what that may do. I, um, I don't think it's going to impact us in any way, shape, or form from uh, a DSAR perspective. I know it is going to, um, in the context that we were talking about it and what they're doing is around the work that we're uh, looking at um, as far as how we manage cookies more so than, than the request. I personally, I don't think based on the discussions that we'll see any different. I think our, I think our process and our scale will remain consistent with what we have today. Doug, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I'm not familiar with that, what you just mentioned with Apple, but I know, I know late last year, uh, we started receiving a few requests via email to the privacy team directly. I think there was some internet site um, that was that is advising people on their privacy rights, and so we started seeing some some email coming in again directly to the privacy team, not coming through our normal sort of intake process. And I think that's you know as I kind of ramp back up here, I think that's a use case we're going to have to kind of look at because I, I do believe as as knowledge about the privacy regulation and privacy is important to people. It's important to me as a consumer, as an individual. Um, I, I suspect that we're going to start to see more of a request like that either coming, you know, through our intake, standard intake process or just via directly to the privacy team. Um, and these were requests from people that, you know, not in California. So. Um. And that, can I just, can I just whoops. it's actually a very interesting point because um, again, because we did GDPR first and then, and then CCPA on top of it. One of the things GDPR requires you to have a data privacy officer, right? So we have to have a way to contact them. And what, what um, we are finding is um, just about every company has got a DPO at name your company or has a privacy at name your company um, mm -hmm. because GDPR pushed us to some extent to have those. But to your point, we do get... Um, we do have to monitor those mailboxes because <clears throat> rather than contacting through the path that we've established, they'll just, you'll get, uh, and we've seen actually a slight increase in third parties acting on behalf of somebody, um, you know, and so we have to, we, we actually had to tweak our process to introduce, because now we've got to go back to the customer and say, hey, did you ask that person to really do that for you? before we just act, but we do, we do have to still maintain those two mailboxes because we still do get blasts into those mailboxes saying, you know, delete me. Um, and then we just have to constantly redirect them to the page to get them in the right spot. We've got another question in our, uh, in our question and answer live chat here. Uh, Jane is asking, and we'll start with Doug this time. Do you mind discussing how do you respond or how do you handle a request that comes in that you just you just can't find them in your system. Um, whether do you look in specific areas or consumer data stores, and you know, how do you handle a request where you just can't find this consumer, but apparently uh, they think you have your their data? Um, well, if yeah, if we don't if we don't find them, then we we respond accordingly. And I think right now, you know, we're not uh, probably as um, near as automated as it sounds like, um, you know, StockX is what Monica's described. So um, we do have as a first, one of our first filters is to determine if they are an Aflac customer, either uh, current or former. 
Um, and there are there are some other in our in our industry there are some other regulations that come into play and and laws like GLBA and HIPAA um, that really um, exempt us from some of the CCPA regulation when it comes to our customers' data. Um, so if we don't find them, then we just basically you know we have 45 days to respond. Um, and I right now I'll be honest with you. I think there was only, we only had one of these last year. Um, again, we have a lower volume <laughs> and um, uh, we'll just kind of take another pass at it manually, you know, doing some uh, manual queries to different business systems and our reporting databases on the back end. And if we still don't find them, then we'll, we'll respond accordingly. Because we do have, we do have data, you know, information governance and your, your corporate, you know, your data retention schedules and all that comes into play too. So, um, so not a lot of experience with that. All right, uh, maybe Monica. Yeah, we do. We do. We um, basically we we set it up. Um, we uh, we basically will look for them based on the data they provided. We ask for three uh, required data points, one optional data point. Um, if we can't find them with those, uh, with those data points, then we just, we basically say we can't find them and it sends them and it just sends an auto response back saying, we can't find you based on the data that you've provided. We do, uh, we, uh, the, the response they get back also includes uh, directions on how to actually go to the stockx.com platform and look at your profile settings to make sure you're sending us the right information that we have on file for you. Um, and basically we just, we close it out and ask them to reopen it with the updated information once they locate it. Right, good, good. I, I see some more questions coming in. So while I kind of gather those, um, um, please please continue to add to the questionnaire box. I think I think we're throwing some uh, some great questions at Doug and Monica here. So this is fantastic. Um, another question that I have, and we'll start with Monica, um, is what would you, as a maybe a project manager, like your privacy team to know, or maybe the technology team to know, maybe someone outside of your normal role? So help me frame the question there. You know, you're in compliance, and so. What would you like your peers to know about you know what you're trying to accomplish maybe something that they don't know that would make your life a lot easier um actually that's an interesting question because we've just started really focusing on um you know communicating to to the company as a whole right so um just the importance of data and the in maintaining the privacy of that data um and educating people on what personal data is it's a big thing that I have been focused on for the last uh, couple of months is um, it, it's it's funny because not everybody is always in sync when you say personal data, what you're talking about. Like, I mean, I have people in the company that are like, well, an email address isn't personal data. And it's like, well, mm, let's be careful there. So um, one of the biggest things that, again, that I'm pushing on is just really making sure that everybody has a common understanding of personal data and what that means relative to the personal data that we hold and what you should and should not be doing. So um, we've really tried to inform and teach people so that we're not inadvertently placing information we shouldn't in like a Slack channel or something like that. So um, it's just trying to find that right balance between being cognizant and conscious of what you're doing and how you're sharing it and not limiting their ability to get their jobs done. And that's the biggest thing that, that um, I've been, you know, that I, I have been working on and focused on within the entire company. Very good. Uh, same question to you, Doug. Um, what would, as a project manager, what would you like the privacy team to know? What would I like the privacy team to know? Um, um, well, we're pretty closely with the privacy team. I think, um, you know, as, as um, kind of repeat some of the things that Monica said, I think just educating the different stakeholders. We've, I had to coordinate with a lot of people across the enterprise um, related to CCPA in a, in a short period of time. And then last year, as we looked at 
you know, anytime, anytime we have kind of a framework that we're wanting to put in anytime, you know, Aflac has made a couple of recent business acquisitions. So anytime there's a business acquisition, anytime there's a new business initiative, like our direct to consumer platform that um, rolled out recently, um, we have to get involved with folks around look, understanding the PII that's being collected and where it's being stored and all that. And then how it, you know, what is the, um, the impact of this new initiative or new business acquisition or new regulation coming down the pike. So I think it's a lot of education and understanding and, and making sure again, they know that, um, you know, we're trying to work not to impact their daily, their daily job because everybody's pretty busy. Um, so just taking that kind of an approach and understanding the importance of why we're doing this. You know, I think, I think at AFLAC and probably a, a lot of financial services companies, everyone understands that, um, you know, we're pretty heavily regulated. So whenever you come with a regulatory need, we usually get, um, at, at least at, at AFLAC, people usually um, typically are, are pretty good about responding to your request and your needs. Um, have kind of a culture of that. So that hasn't been too much of a problem. But I think, I think as we move forward and, and as this continues to grow and it's gonna be, it's gonna be important, I, I think the communication plan um, is gonna be extremely important across the enterprise this year as we roll out more awareness. Um, we wanna look at a privacy impact analysis process and things like that. So. Um, yeah, just a lot of communication and coordination. And that sounds, uh, that, that sounds challenging. <laughs> um, let's, uh, let's maybe go next. Uh, let's start with Doug first and then go over to Monica. I've got another question from our chat box here. Um, getting a few questions around the type of data that you use to submit subject access requests, like an example would be, the question is, you know, are you collecting emails, names, phone numbers, et cetera, et cetera? Um, typically, what what kind of kind of data do you use? Um, the question derives from, you know, sometimes some some uh, consumers don't use email that often, or you know, maybe they only submit their phone number depending on um, uh, different parts of the world that they're from. So, um, what type of requests and what data fields generally do you key off of to retrieve their data? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I haven't looked at this in a couple of months, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, first and last name, uh, your address, uh, we do require an email address. If, if someone doesn't have an email address, there's the ability to, you know, send a request in via mail um, and that's available to them. So name and address, um, the zip code's important, uh, date of birth is important. I think that, I think those are the fields we key off of in terms of determining if if someone is a, is a policy holder, um, yeah, first name, last name, date of birth and zip code, we usually start with that. So we've got to have that information in there. And then we also ask for some other pieces of data around, you know, whether or not they're an individual policy holder, um, group policy holder or um, spouse or dependent. So some, some data like that. Uh, Monica, over to you. Same, same, same question. Uh, what type of data are you recruiting? Okay, we're a, we're a lot less complicated <laughs> than Doug. Um, we we do key off of email. All of our our customers are engaged in our platform with their email address. So we are email first last name. There is a StockX username um, <clears throat> in the profile that they can optionally provide, but primarily it's first last name and email address. Yeah, we're a little more complicated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, where I have volume, you have complication. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Oh. We have another question. Um, how, and, and I think we talked a little bit that you were more in the GSAR space rather than assessment, but what are, what are your key items that your company looks for when conducting privacy impact assessments? Uh, Monica, I don't know if you want to start first, or maybe you're doing this with, a, with another group. Um, the, the basis is around privacy shield and the kind of things that you're looking for. 
Uh, yeah, interesting question. So, you know, honestly, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of how to answer that, right? Um, we, we, in the end, we don't hold a significant amount of personal data on our, on our customers, on our platform. Um, so uh, we've done um, initial PIAs across the company um, and where we've gone. The challenge that we're faced with right now, which is actually what I was alluding to earlier, we are gonna get the next module st stood up. Um, is because we have been growing so fast and we've brought so many additional third party, party um, tools to the platform. We've, we are at the stage right now where we have to redo the initial base work that we did from a PIA perspective and understanding where all our data sits um, and, and doing that additional legwork, which is why we're, we're pushing. It's one of our actually 2021 objectives. Um, is to basically re, regroup, I say regroup, right? But basically um, redo what we did previously from a, from a data mapping perspective and a PIA perspective and make sure that we are really in sync with what data we have with all of the new third-party tools that we brought into the environment as we've grown so much over the last two years. Um, and which is why the automation piece and the additional module, um, we wanna get that up sooner rather than later now because early analysis that we did with the tool with some of the auto discovery capabilities actually found some data we weren't even aware of that was sitting somewhere on our network um, that we were able to get in front of. So um, hopefully that answers the question. It does, thank you. Uh, over to Doug, uh, I can kind of reiterate. It's more about privacy impact assessments. How do you handle those without your, within your company? Is that something that you do or you have a tool for? Um, you know, the, the, the question is around privacy shield and uh, the things that you look for when you do privacy impact assessments. Yeah, so, so far, you know, everything we've done, we've done so far is more from a project basis, kind of initial starting with, you know, being initially compliant with CCPA. And that's actually one of, we're kind of in the early stages of um, wanting to migrate to a, a standard privacy impact assessment process and um, get, get that process in place um, going forward this year. So I don't, we don't really have a standard sort of uh, BAU type process. Um, we've just, as um, you know, we've addressed again, some recent acquisitions and and a new business initiative last year, just following the same model that we used on the project of determining, you know, kind of three, three major areas or framework of three items, you know, looking at any impact to the um, privacy governance, the online changes that need to be made to privacy policies and so forth, impact to the, to the DSAR request process, um, call center, and then, um, the data processing inventory and data map. So we we address all of those areas, or that's what we've done to date, but more from a project perspective. Um, and I think we're wanting to migrate to more of a you know strategic kind of getting out in front of things as new regulations come in, as maybe marketing or sales kicks off new business initiatives to be aware of those early on, and um, yeah, stuff like that. Right, so we are getting close to time. Um, I do have one more question and I'm gonna hold it, your prediction to both of you. I'm gonna ask you in three years whether this is right or wrong, so, but I'll, I'll start with Doug first and then I'll go to Monica and we'll, we'll, then we'll kind of ponder how that, how that feels. So the, <laughs> the question is, um, what do you predict data privacy will look like in three years? And how do you feel that IT's role, technology's role will play in that, um, uh, Doug? Oh, okay, um, boy. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I think, what do I think it will look like in three years? I think there'll be um, just a, a continuing focus um, on data privacy, both from a you know, government and regulatory standpoint and, uh, and from the individual consumers will, you know, will help, will want to drive a lot of this too and want to make sure that their, you know, that their information is protected. 
is being protected and so forth. Um, from a process and technology standpoint, I, I think that, you know, the probably the same fundamental process is being able to, you know, the DSAR process is important. Privacy impact assessment process is important. And, and a lot more, you know, again, we're, we're um, probably a lot more um, automated automation and particularly in integration with your systems and handling access and delete requests um, and capturing and storing opt-out requests for folks and making sure that um, if people do opt out, that their data is not picked up and, um, you know, being provided uh, if there's some new marketing initiative or so forth, you know, Aflac doesn't sell, we don't sell our customers data, but, um, you know, in, any sort of new marketing initiatives over the years could drive, um, maybe kind of look at that differently. So, um, you know, making sure that their data is protected and they're aware of how it's being collected and used and, and distributed. I think it'll just be, it'll just continue to ramp up. Yeah, uh, and then so, Monica, what, what, is, uh, what will data privacy look like and what will be IT's role, technology's role in data privacy three years? And I'm recording this, so I'm going to recording. Ask you so, okay, so you'll come back in three years and we'll talk to see how close we were. Um, honestly, I think the good, uh, the, the plus and minuses of it, right? In three years, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's continuing to grow. We already know China's coming out with their privacy laws. India's getting ready to come out with theirs. I think the reality is uh, every one of our 50 states has a version of a privacy law. So um, it's only going to get get become more and more prominent. Um, I also think that similar to what they did in Europe uh, with the EU and GDPR, I guess I'm, I'm gonna predict that we might start to see a little bit better alignment across the different regulations so that we don't have so many different ones that we have to worry about and try to get, um, hopefully get some more consistency um, as far as requirements and things that, that we need to do. Um, I think we saw a little bit of in that in CCPA because they, you know, they they closely follow GDPR, which was a positive thing, right? Um, so definitely they're not going away. I think uh, consumers are way more educated than they have in the past just because of the technological world that we live in today. Um, and I think we're gonna see um, a normalization to some extent of the privacy laws, but we're also going to see more focus from a consumer perspective on exercising their rights, uh, you know, as, as the, the time goes on. I mean, we're already seeing that today. Um, as far as technology's role, 100%. I mean, technology is going to be the key to, is the key to managing these different laws, right? Whether, as Doug pointed out, making sure that our opt-in and opt-out um, answers or, you know, requests are managed to the point of really uh, understanding where our data is, how we're using that data, where it's flowing to, where it's flowing from, um, and tagging things in a way that helps us understand a lot more quickly what is, is happening or what may or may not be happening with our data and where it is um, versus today where, you know, we can tend to, I mean, Sometimes you don't always know we're not, you know, where where you might want to be. So IT is going to be significant just in keeping track of everything and helping us to manage it more consciously um, as the laws continue to just increase and grow. I think that uh, between the three of us here and, and uh, the large number at home, it's a we all can agree that how much data privacy will change in three years. Um, it, it, it's a rapidly evolving space. And I think that everyone is just uh, getting ready for the big wave. Uh, a lot of, of us are already riding the wave uh, in, in, in the direction of compliance. So really, really excited. Uh, thank you, Monica. Thank you, Doug. Uh, I've, I've really enjoyed the conversation today. I've, I've truly, uh, I've learned something new, which I hope everyone at home who's, uh, who's asked us in the QA box and sending messages. Uh, I hope you've learned something new as well. This is important to us and important to me. So uh, thank you so much. I'm gonna turn this back over to Judy, who's our host for today.
Thanks, guys. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much, Monica, um, Doug, and Stephen for a great conversation. And yes, this is recorded, so we, we'll be back in touch in three years. To see how your <laughs> predictions. <laughs> um, so before we uh, end the, the webinar, I just want to let everyone know that Wirewheel has a new free CCPA training course. Um, you can sign up right now at a wirewheel.io for you or any of your employees, and it's CCPA compliance training. Um, again, thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Um, reach out to Wirewheel if you have any questions. Thank you.